Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Katherine Garforth from Garforth Education, and this is the Right to Read Initiative, where we are doing our best to help educators make sure that they can support that their students along their reading journey. Uh, a lot of the conversations are based on the Ontario Human Rights Commission's Right to Read Public Inquiry report and recommendations. Today, there are some specific recommendations that I'm gonna be speaking about and they are recommendation 27A, 30A, B and C. So I'll, I'll show you those in a minute uh, before we get deeper into our conversation. But today I have the pleasure of being joined by Janelle Keller. Now this is the first of three conversations we're gonna have this week. Today we're talking about the three queuing system and high school students. So, you know, a lot of people hear, you know, we shouldn't do three queuing and, but they see that it's working in those early grade levels with those level texts and the predictable readers, but they're not seeing the long-term effect. So our conversation today is trying to give you insight to what it looks like in high school. When we use these strategies with students in the primary grades, but they don't, pick up the code that they need for reading automatically. And in some schools, and that's a smaller percentage, but in other schools, it's almost the entire population. So thank you for joining me today, Janelle. Thanks wanna, for having me. <laughs> do you want to give everybody um, a brief uh, intro of who you are and okay. where you're teaching? Tomorrow, we're going to go a little bit more into your journey to the science of reading, but let's okay. start with who you are. Okay. Um, I am a high school teacher. I am a reading specialist on our, I'm the only reading specialist on our campus. Um, I work out of the, through the English department. What I do is not a companion to the English classes. So we're not doing their homework. It's specifically focused on reading. And what, um, what I find with the, the three queuing system is, is I was trained in balanced literacy and using Fontes and Pinnell and all of that in about 2000. That was my initial training in reading. And I had no reason at that time to think that, you know, everything wasn't going to be wonderful. And as I, about 15 years ago, I stepped into the high school setting and this is my, well, this is my 16th year at this particular school. And I am in the Central Valley. So I'm in Central California. We are a Title I high school, which means that I believe we're the only Title I high school in our district. Uh, we have 100% free lunch. Um, most of my students are um, Hispanic. Um, so we're kind of, uh, our high school is probably, um, I want to say we're maybe medium sized compared to the other ones, maybe about 1500 total student body. So we have a fair amount of students that are coming to us from the middle school that are not reading at what most everybody calls grade level, right? So about 10 years ago, that's when I started tracking uh, the information that we were getting. And I had kind of wondered about why why so many kids we'd hear the complaints I would hear complaints from my peers about the kids don't do their homework they can't do their homework won't do their homework um all those kind of things and it became pretty clear when I started digging into it that the their ability to read at an I call an age appropriate level I, I stopped using grade level uh, it's a little demoralizing for the teenagers when they you know, to contemplate, like, what do you mean I'm reading at a quote, you know, like fourth grade level? It's like, ah, there's already so many hurdles that we have to overcome. So I started using a term called age appropriate. And they were not reading, you know, anywhere near where they should be at 14 or 15 years old. So that sort of started me. I went in with all my basic stuff, right? Uh, what I knew what to do as a reading teacher. 
And I didn't really see that much success with it, with the teenagers. I would have like a handful of kids that would just like blossom, but I had so many more that weren't. And that prompted me to look into why, you know, how come if this is so wonderful and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I can pull small groups. I can do individualized instruction. I know time is a constraint in high school, but why am I not seeing the kind of growth you know, and, and why do they have such deficits when they come here? And I was, and I wondered why, and, you know, without really, I'm not trying to blame any colleagues below me and, you know, the K-8, but somewhere we have to kind of draw this line and uh, the kids just didn't have the, they don't have the skills when they come. And it's not a small group. It is anywhere from 40 to 45%, plus or minus 2%. If my, you know, I track them on a spreadsheet how many come into us at really low. So I teach uh, freshmen reading anywhere between kindergarten where they're leveled at is between kindergarten and like sixth grade. So I have a huge swath and I don't know. And and that's what kind of started this. And one of the, for me to understand what I need to do, I need to understand what they're doing. And that got me to, look more closely at balanced literacy, look more closely at the queuing system. And I start, it just started uh, clicking with me about, wow, how that's looking in a high school classroom. And it's really detrimental to them at this point because the, the skills that they were taught to rely on when they were younger uh, are not serving them in high school. So um, that's really, that's kind of where I, that's where I am coming from. So I don't know what you want to, where'd you, where would you like me to start? Well, first I want to share a quote from Linda Farrell. She wrote an article for Readsters called the first rule of reading, keep your eyes on the words. And it says almost all students I meet who have decoding weaknesses share a common behavior. Can you guess what it is? They look up from the page before they finish reading a word or a sentence. Many just glance at the word and guess what it is that they're looking or as they look at me for approval. Others look at the word more carefully, yet they still look at me for approval when they say what they think the word is. A few look at this word before staring at the ceiling or somewhere in space while trying to figure out what the word is. Yeah. Every elementary school and every reading interventionist I meet recognizes these behaviors and can associate them with specific students. Yep. Would you say that that's true for what you? Absolutely. You Absolutely. And uh, I have um, I have a grandson that I work with. He who's in our school district. Uh, he's second grade. He mm-hmm. was struggling with reading because when we went on that, you know, when they cut school off in March, he was in the middle of kindergarten. And then most of his first year was first, uh, first grade was zooming. So uh, what he was getting for his reading instruction wasn't working for him. Mm -hmm. And finally I started, uh, taking him every day after school and I started, and that's when it really started to gel with me as far as, oh my God, I literally am working with a second grader. I see him do the same thing and I'll look at the page, like, look at the word. Don't look at me. Mm -hmm. And he does, he'll, you know, he doesn't have the skill set as a second grader to look at chunks. He just, he does now, but we've been working for months and months and he's doing great now. But what I saw were his behaviors with reading and it just really clicked over. Like, this is exactly what my freshmen are still doing. And Mm -hmm. so that was the, that was the link I needed to just click it down for myself. And, and I was like, okay, yeah, this is definitely detrimental. This is not, this has to be undone. They need, they de- they need a different set of skills to work with the text in front of them so that they can be successful. So, um, sure. I see that, I see that a lot. They will uh, word call, right? So, um, well, if I back up by the time they get to high school, they're given lists of words to memorize. And it's really obvious that they, they memorize, they're working at trying to memorize the picture of the word because they don't have the, they don't have a skill set to break it down into any kind of chunks. They, they just are memorizing words and the ones that stick 
are the ones that they can read doesn't necessarily mean that they know what it means <clears throat> but um they uh how could I, when when they are when they're presented with a similar word they don't make a connection because it doesn't look exactly like the picture does that make sense and so they don't have they don't have the it's almost like so when they see a similar word it just goes like this <laughs> they, they make zero connection with it and the other thing that we have to think about is the different fonts right and that's why yeah. memorizing the picture of a word right or if it's capital or lowercase yes we can't rely on that because it's not gonna allow the students to know the word outside of context right or the outside of what they've memorized so right. they're not actually orthographically mapping words so they're not putting no. it in site word vocabulary they're not going to have that ability to recognize it in text within a fraction of a second unless it looks exactly the same right but it's not that they truly know the word and understand it right it's spelling and ha- how to read it right and it, it leads to a lot of word calling mm-hmm. and th- that that same that same eye movement that they do they'll look at their reading and it'll be, and this just happened the other day. Uh, the word was in infidelity. I can't remember what we were, the text we were reading infidelity. So they saw in fin in like that chunk. And they're like infinity. I was like, what? And I said, you didn't, I said, look, and then they looked up at me, the student looked up at me and I was like, no, I said, look back at the word. What are, what are, what do you see? And it, it was, but there's this confusion. Like what? I'm like, no, look at the word really look at the word let's just look at the letters for a second and the student looked down and was like oh and then started I said apply what you know we've been working on the these vowel sounds let's, let's mm. you know let's figure it out and then it then they got to it but it's it's not just word calling by the time they get to high school they've had so much practice with um looking for a cue from somebody else that when they don't this leads right into skipping words so mm. They end up, if they don't get any sort of confirmation or help with the word, they just run right over it and they just keep going Mm -hmm. and they'll skip as, and they literally will skip as many words as are on the page that they can't recognize immediately. They will just skip, skip, skip. And the result is that they get to the end of the page and they're like, I don't know what I just read. Yeah. So skipping the frog isn't working for them. It's right. The frog, right? Right. Yeah. you know, when you don't have context or meaning and you're not having those words in your vocabulary without the tools to decode them, you're kind of, you know, out of luck. Yeah. You, and you're missing that opportunity to gain the knowledge. And then it makes you feel stupid because you read maybe five or 10 words on the page, mm-hmm. of a text that, you know, your other peers are reading without difficulty. Mm-hmm. And this is the stuff you're supposed to be learning and you're supposed to know how to read. And that's horrible for a student's self-esteem. It is very <laughs> horrible. I, I spend, I spend probably three months convincing the teenagers that are in my class that they need help with their reading. Cause they, they'll tell me that I, well, I passed my ELA class or I got an A or a B in my ELA class, or, you know, I can read and what I have to break down for them is yes, you can read, which is why I stopped saying grade levels. Like you're, you're reading words, but the word where you're at is not at an age appropriate level for you right now. So that's what we got to work on. And, and that goes back to, they can recognize the words they can recognize but they literally don't have a connection between what do I do with the words that are on the page that I don't, that I don't recognize. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they can say a word, but they don't know what it means. And they don't even know that they're supposed to question or ask. Mm-hmm. They, they, they don't make the connection that every word I read on the page, I'm supposed to understand or have some meaning from. That's why when I get to the bottom of a page, let's say like, that's why I have some questions about what I read. I run into a lot of, I don't know, and blanks. And I, at first, you know, when it happens, and I think this probably happens in other classes, teachers may think in high school that a student is just being difficult or something um, or not paying attention. 
if you are not accessing, I don't know, 98% of the words on a page, at least, you know, 100%, right, is the goal. It's really hard to decipher specific information that they're required to understand in high school. Mm-hmm. You know, and when the teacher is giving you Romeo and Juliet, even if it's a somewhat abridged version, that's still way over their head. The complexity of the text and not even having the skill set to break down a word. They, they don't have the skill set to even try to break it down and like chunk it out and whatever. They just they don't they don't do that. And they don't know that they're capable of doing it either because they've been trained for so long. If you don't know a word, skip it, go back and figure it out. Uh, Use the pictures to help you figure it out. Hey, use, look at the, look at the index, look at the, look at the, the context features of, of the text. That stuff doesn't help them. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking and I'm looking at them literally, they will, they, my students will literally stare at a word not moving their mouth, not trying to sound it out, like just stare at it as if staring at it will somehow put it in there. Does that make sense? I'm like, what are you doing? Definitely. And, and they're, and they're, yeah, I'm trying, not just I'm trying, I'm work trying to figure, <laughs> they're like, I'm trying to figure this word out, but are you sounding it out in your head? I, I don't hear anything. What are you doing with it? And they're just like, I don't know. Like, I just, I'm just looking at the word <laughs> and I'm like, oh gosh. So I see all of these things kind of wrapped together and it's sad for the high school kids because I realized that in high school, the answer isn't teach them reading, which that's my answer, but the school district. And I think at large, you know, probably in our nation is hand them graphic organizers. Like let's give them a KWL chart. Let's give them Venn diagrams. Let's do, you know, because they attribute it to a comprehension problem. Mm-hmm. And yes, it is a comprehension problem, but it is a comprehension problem rooted in the fact that they can't dissect the text word by word, let alone string that together to make any meaning. So it's it's way deeper than that. KWL charts are not going to work um, for students that can't read the text. Mm-hmm. And I, I see all of these things sort of morphing together in the high school and we use the terms. I tell my colleagues, how many times have you heard us directed by our district office and all these trainers that come through? Hope I don't get in trouble for saying that. But, you know, have the kids look at the pictures. Like, well, you know, they, looking at that picture in the world history book, that picture isn't going to help them understand the five words that are in that paragraph that they can't get. And that's just in one paragraph. Mm-hmm. So if there's five words in every paragraph, there's 70 words that they don't know in that section of text. That's a lot of work. And they can't, they can't do it by themselves because they don't have the skill set to do it. And well, and I think an important thing to highlight here is, is often, at least uh, at a lot of schools, it's like, well, give them access to technology. Well, when you're talking about 40 to 50% of the student population, I'm pretty sure the school doesn't have funding to provide each of these students with an iPad or a Chromebook or some sort of tablet to help them get access to the text. And given the demographics of your school, I can almost guarantee that the parents aren't going to be able to provide that for them. So just we we do have Chromebooks for every student. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And we worked really hard to get uh, hotspots and Wi Fi access for our students. And that really took up a good chunk of that initial part of the pandemic. So we do have that technology. Do they get to keep them? They, yeah, yeah, they have them. So but after they graduate, no, after they graduate, no, they are turned in, they're checked out. So I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Maybe they have them for while they're at school and in school, but long-term. Right. Kids don't have money gra- graduating high school to go. Yeah. And per- like we can't assume that they're going to have access to this technology Correct. and be able to use it going forward. So while we're putting a Band-Aid solution on the problem so they can, you know, get through their coursework, they're not going to be able to read the menu. They're right. not going to read the job application. 
Mm-hmm. They're not going to be able to do the basic reading that they need to do. Well, not basic, but the reading that they need to do to get a buy in everyday life. They're not going to be and that, functionally literate. And that and that's what I call age appropriate, right? Mm-hmm. For 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 them, like, it, what do you what do you need to do when you're 18, right? Mm-hmm. When you graduate, what are the things that are going to be out there in the adult world that you need to start handling? And mm-hmm. that's the that's the skill set that you need at the very minimum. Mm -hmm. And many of them don't have it. I've looked at data in my school district. We had um, several, a few years ago, we had a convocation and our superintendent was very proud and told, you know, our second graders, they, they just had implemented some kind of a reading assessment for second grade. And he told, you know, the whole district that, um, 60% 60% of the second graders are exiting second grade on grade level. And yay, everybody thought. I sat there going, what about that 40%? Because that 40%, that number, even, even when I read outside studies from our district, when I look at things in other states or nationwide, that 40% is kind of a solid number. You know, there's like that 40%, 50%, like right in there. That's a constant of students that are not reading where they should be. And, and it's a number that doesn't seem to go away. I have yet to read a, uh, any kind of report or anything that shows any program that closes that deficit gap for teenagers once they hit high school who are already below. Mm-hmm. There's and nothing, I- there's nothing, nothing heartening anyway. Yeah. The thing to note is that, you know, there are several studies pointing to being able to get 95% of our students reading at grade level or the age appropriate level by the end of grade three. Yeah. And that's when the most effective intervention time is. I would agree. And working with high school students who have reading disabilities or can't read, whether it's they have dyslexia or they just weren't taught you are dealing with a whole bunch of emotional baggage Mm -hmm. and embarrassment and learned helplessness and in a set mindset thinking, you know what, you don't really care. It's not going to make a difference. It hasn't Mm -hmm. before. So why should I do this now? And it's not something that's going to be a quick fix. Mm -mm. You need the student to be committed to doing the work because it is hard work and it's not going to happen overnight. So now I want to quickly go over those uh, recommendations from the Ontario human rights commission's report. Uh, And I'll just share my screen so you can see what I'm referring to. Oh, I moved. There we go. So the first one is revising the kindergarten program and grades one through eight in the language curriculum. The Ministry of Education should work with with external experts to advise Ontario's kindergarten program and grade eight or one through eight language curriculum to remove all references to queuing, queuing systems and guessing strategies for word reading they need to remove any references or or to any other instructional approaches to teaching foundational reading skills that have not been scientifically violated. Now, I know this is specifically talking about Ontario and their Ministry of Education, but realistically, this applies to any school curriculum anywhere because Mm -hmm. You know, study after study has shown that this doesn't work. And when we look at the neuroimaging studies, we know that this is not how the brain becomes uh, a fluent reader who can comprehension, comprehend what they're reading. Mm-hmm. Now, the next one has to do with reviewing early literacy resources. And it's about removing all references to the queuing queuing systems and guided or guessing strategies for word reading remove all reference to balanced literacy and associated concepts such as teaching word reading with the use of queuing systems 
or through reading books within the current gradual release of responsibility model instruction mm-hmm. through modeling book reading with word problem solving using queuing systems shared reading with word problem solving using queuing systems guided and independent text reading focused on word problem solving queuing systems and mini lessons remove all references to any other instructional approaches and teaching foundational word reading skills that have not been scientifically validated. So these these recommendations are part of the recommendations help highlight what you're seeing in your classroom and Mm -hmm. the results of these instructional strategies being in place where the students are guessing and skipping words and we can't get mad at them for no. what they've been taught right to. and it, it's very it can be hard for them to accept that what the teachers taught them isn't effective and as mm-hmm. a teacher you can't say well you know that teacher was wrong right uh, you, you have to have that professional um respect and responsibility of not putting down your colleagues, but at the same time telling your students, well, that's, let's try reading a different way. And that can be very difficult. Especially at this point for high school kids, because they really don't want to be in a reading class. The second semester is better. So this semester, they are all, they're all wrapped into it and they realize that they don't know what they didn't know. And, Mm -hmm. and I started, I started out with, well, tell me what the vowels are. Mm -hmm. And none of my students this year could tell me what the vowels were. They didn't know what, a, they didn't know vowels from consonants. And some of them knew some of the vowels, but it was that sort of looking at the ceiling, reaching for a, you know, like, uh, oh, and then looking at me like, that's right. Right. And, and it was this agonizing process class after class. And I would tell them, I said, okay, so without thinking, please blurt out the answer. What I'm going to say, just blurt it out. And I said, two plus two, four. I said, at 14 years old, that's how you should know the vowels. Mm -hmm. You should just be able to rattle them off. And then the one we would, I write the vowels on the board or on my Elmo. And I said, so what's the short sound of A? All kind of noises, you know, ah, 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 you know, oh no. And it's, you know, that's part of that basic component of being able to know what to do when you see a word that you don't know if they don't know the vowels there's no way they can break it down into a syllable because they don't know that every syllable has to have a vowel so you can't even teach you can't even start there because you have to start with like what the vowels are and what I found working with my grandson was it's not that his teacher and she's a wonderful teacher and it's not it's not that she doesn't teach any phonics. It's that there's no systematic approach to it to make sure that all the bases are covered for whatever that age appropriate level is for, you know, learning how vowels and vowel teams operate, right? So there's there's no systematic approach to that. And I see that that's part of all of this problem because they're, they're, um, they were trained, the kids had decodable texts excuse me, um, predictable text, not decodable ones. So even when they were taught the phonics that they were taught, um, they didn't really have a practice outside of, I saw my grandson reading pages in his book and he wouldn't even be looking at the words. And I said, oh, what are you doing? I'm reading the book. No, you're not. <laughs> you're saying the words. Um, so my students are still doing that. They're still trying to just, you know, make words fit that don't, don't even make sense. And it doesn't even, it it doesn't even ring a bell for them that it's not making sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I, it's just, it's kind of disheartening, you know, and at, for the teenagers to get to this point using the tools that they were given. And I tell them, I said, this isn't your fault, you know, and I tell them straightforward, I was trained to teach reading a certain kind of way back in 2000. That's before any of you guys were born. But over time, it's become clear that that's really not, it's not 
working for all students or en enough students. And just because a system works for 50 or 60%, that's a huge chunk of kids that aren't getting it. And we have to try something different. Mm -hmm. And I guess I have, I have five grandkids. So the first two just kind of flew by with reading. It wasn't difficult, but it was the, this, the third one that he struggled in it because COVID hit. And so whatever struggles he was having just were exacerbated. Mm -hmm. And it did allow me a window into what is happening in the second grade classrooms. And I saw that direct connection to my high school kids. So I don't know that I can't, I just couldn't keep teaching the way I was teaching. And that just makes me dig because mm -hmm. I want the answer. Of I want to fix it. I mean, we all want to fix it. So, um, and I think to just to circle back around when I talked to his teacher, she chose just how we were taught, like, oh, here's the picture book. Here's what we're using. And here's the, the phonics that are in there that I can pull from. What that looks like for a teenager is Swiss cheese. Mm -hmm. And every student has a Swiss cheese chunk for their reading process. They don't all have the same holes in the same spot, but they all have holes, which makes it really hard for the high school level because I only have them 57 minutes a day. Um, and if they're absent a day and that was the day I had planned with their group or them, I mean, it's just gone. Cause the next day I have a whole other group. I got to see, I don't have the time to roll them back in later in the day. I just have them for that chunk, but they have, so not only are they reading between kindergarten and sixth grade-ish, that even the kids that, if you're going to say they were um, in the fifth grade zone, let's say, because of the Swiss cheese that they have, because they had different teachers, so they got different things, um, or absence create those pockets of either misinformation or no information. And um, so even in a group, in a small group, it's hard to pinpoint like, oh, but you got this and you got this, but you don't have this. Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes, I call it my three ring circuit circus. Okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to like, like, I'm just trying to like, oh my God, like, make it work, make it work. Can so, you um, assume that most of your students know their consonant sounds? No, I have students that didn't even, couldn't put the alphabet in order. I, I bought, um, and we, I know we'll, we'll do this on another thing, but mm -hmm. I got the, uh, let magnetic letters and I would mix it all up and say like, okay put them put them in order and I'm watching high school students sing the ABC song A B C D and they're like doing things and then they get to the L M N O P as like N M N O P and I'm watching them I just let them do it and I'm like because I want to know what mm -hmm. what they know and they would in high school they're putting the let the alphabet together and then they have leftover letters. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, like, okay, let's, let's go. Let me help you here. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so then that, ha that's a whole other level of practice, right? That's, that's something else because they don't have access to the letters in any sort of order and they don't know all the sounds. And I often find that they don't, they don't enunciate the sounds either. So that's a whole other thing I have to teach them is the, I do the whole vocal thing, like feel your, can you feel it back here? What do you feel right here? Where's your tongue? You mm -hmm. know, it's, you know, behind your teeth or it's behind your front teeth or it's on top or mm, your lip, whatever, because they don't, they're not sure what the clear sound is. They hear something, but what they hear is because they're not hearing something clearly. Mm -hmm. So that affects everything. It affects how they say a word. It affects how they would even go about spelling it. And because they don't have a clear understanding of what vowels or vowel consonant chunks might make the vowel, they're, they're still doing the, like a higgy hater sound. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's I-G-H-T. That's the sound, I-G-H. That's its own little chunk. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow. And that hurts them. Of course. And you've got to think when they're reading these, you know, high school level texts and they don't have the skills. Well, 
first of all, it's extremely taxing on their working memory, especially when they're looking at multi-syllable words. Yes. So even the process of sounding out a word, say if it's three syllables, they might not have the storage capacity in their brain available yes. right. to hold all of the grapheme phoneme correspondences that they've sounded out to mm-hmm. put that together. And that's extremely frustrating. There, and- I, I tell them, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to talk oh, about that. That um, I, I let them know that like, your brain has JPEGs stored in there of words. <laughs> so yeah. you don't need all the JPEGs because I'm yeah. going to give you the tools to access the JPEG. It's like, if you, we can put all those words in the cloud yeah. You have to run around with them in your head all day. I use a lot of like Wi-Fi analogies with them. And yeah, I talk about your brain. The picture that you want in your phone. Yeah. It's yeah. Clogging it up and then you can't yeah. update. Like, no, you don't want that. So, and I, I teach them, I said, you know, your brain has a bandwidth. Like, let's just say yeah. like Wi-Fi is like this and I, you know, I'll draw a picture on there. So your brain has to, your brain's busy right now, funneling out the noise from the street. And they're like, what? I'm like, just listen. I'm like, oh yeah, we hear that. We hear that your, your brain is busy, you know, like it recognizes all the colors or things that are around the room or whatever. So your brain has to work. It's taking up that bandwidth to tune out noise Mm -hmm. so that it can focus. And if you're do, you know, and when you're, you only have so much of that. And if you're doing things or things are happening in the classroom or whatever, or you're struggling, it's really easy. You know, your brain can just get tired. And they, and I have to teach them what you said earlier was a learned helplessness. I wrote that kind of down what it looks like and sound like in high school is that is a lack of background knowledge, helplessness, a learned helplessness and a dependency. Mm-hmm. So they don't, and, um, I have to work with now at this point, I'm like, you know, y'all bring something to the table. I said, when you, when you go to somebody's house, you know, for Thanksgiving dinner, you bring like some rolls or whatever you bring. So you, you got to start coming to me with something in your hand. And I teach, I'm teaching them that what you bring to the table is your good question. Mm -hmm. If you don't know a word, bring that to the table. Like Miss Keller, this, I didn't understand this word, or I, I had trouble, whatever it is like, okay, that's a great question. Let's work on that. Mm-hmm. And I'm now having kids come to me, they'll come to my desk or they'll come to the table and they're bringing these good questions because they, they didn't even know that they were supposed to question mm-hmm. what they didn't know. Because first of all, it wasn't registering that they didn't know it because mm-hmm. their eye was scanning the words. And so they thought that that was reading and they thought that reading was dumb because, well, they read all the words. I don't understand what I read. Does not make any sense? So reading stupid reading has no meaning for me. They don't have any the, the reading wasn't holding pleasure or information for them. It was just this chore that, like you said, taxed their brain. Mm-hmm. So, you know, every time I, you know, I would come to that, but then it was like, I have to back up several steps. Like, well, where does that start? I'm always kind of concerned about where does it start? Because I can't fix it. I can't I really address the problem until I get to the bottom of it. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, oh, you guys really, you really don't know the question to ask. Well, they don't know what they don't know, right? Exactly. And, and so now, yeah, now they're becoming they're aware of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, and, and the school year is going to be over. And then I have a new batch. And that's, what's really frustrating for me is that uh, it just takes so long. So I've been asking all my classes this year. I said, what? where you guys feel now, what should I start off like day one? Where do I need to start with next year's freshmen that are coming in? And they're like, ask them what all the vowels and consonants are. Do that one. <laughs> I was like, okay, I can do that. I won't wait. I'll just jump on it. <laughs> and, uh, cause that's really what, that's really what sort of hooked them in. And, um, they realized, yeah, I, I don't know all those things. And once they started recognizing the chunks and that, wait, letters, have a di- you can certain letters combined vowels or vowels with consonants um yeah and they have a rather consistent sound and i tell them you know 99 of the time it's going to be this way there's that one percent that's going to be different but that's okay you just learn the time when it's different because most of the time it's going to be this way and and it's and it's okay and it's okay that the rules seem tricky 
when you drive down the road, there's certain things that are, you know, you know what the rules of the road are. And then all of a sudden you're driving down the freeway and they're doing construction and it gets tricky because you didn't expect to see that weird little lane go off there with that sign that you never saw before, but you're pretty good at driving. So you just, you know, you figure it, that's how it is. So it's okay. And now they know they don't, I think that they feel more confident, right? At this point in the year, they don't feel like they know it's not their fault. They know that they're not stupid. And I told them all that, you know, how smart you are to hold that many JPEGs in your brain. Cause that's a lot. Yeah. So that's a testament to their ability to learn. And I think we, we overlook that a lot uh, in education because they, they are in that below zone, you know, somehow that makes them not as intelligent as the kids that are proficient. What it makes them is as smart as Mm -hmm. the way they were taught didn't give them enough leftover capacity to stay caught up. If that makes sense. The kids, who, the kids who were getting it didn't, they, they were, they were going to get the reading no matter how you taught it. Mm-hmm. Well, and then we see that Matthew effect where the, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The kids mm-hmm. that have been reading all since that primary school, their right. vocabulary and their comprehension and their buy-in to school yeah. will likely be so much higher because they can do it. Yes. And they've, they've been entertained by stories they could read. They've garnered information from texts that they've read. And they're like, oh, I learned something from reading that. As opposed to the kids I'm with, they read and they're like, I didn't get anything out of that. Mm-hmm. What's the point? They're just, they, yeah, what's the point? And they look at you like, ah, that's dumb. I want to do this. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, man. So, but that is, it's, and it's really hard for high school kids because everything about high school is learning information, everything. Mm-hmm. So you know, they're expected to read texts that are above where their ability is. And most teachers just don't have the ability to deal with that in high school. And it's not their fault either because they're single subjects, teachers who didn't and weren't expected to be reading teachers on top of the the content, you know? So they're frustrated. So they end up modifying things with, well, they'll, they'll take a smaller chunk, right? So you only have to do this much and they'll, they will take less from a student, which just continues to exact with good heart, with good intention, right? Good meaning, because they don't want to frustrate the student in front of them, Mm -hmm. but it, it's by the, but it is still feeding into the the uh, dependency and the lack of background knowledge because they're not getting, they're still not getting the full picture. They still don't have access to the full information that other kids who are reading at an age appropriate level are getting. So they just, they just stay behind. So what does it feel like when you get that first buy-in from the kids in your class? It feels good. I start, I can see, like, I get the energy. I get like, I say the light bulbs go on. So now, uh, and it's kind of cool because I'm now seeing kids, I, and their conversation changes. So when they're working on stuff in their little groups and, you know, every teacher who ever does groups, you know, that you're with the group in front of you, but you're, they're still like, you, you got little feelers out, out, out in the, out, I call it out in the wild. So out in the wild. And I hear the little discussions of, well, no, that's a, that's long a, 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 a members say a, <laughs> okay. So they're, they're getting comfortable using the skills that they're learning and it makes me feel good. And I just, I wish that I had more time. That's what I wish. So I'm hoping next year I'm using, I'm going to use my students this year input, like help me reach the next group quicker. Like, what can I do? It's, you know, but it feels really good when they do that. And I'm really loving that they are bringing their questions to the table. Do you have the opportunity to bring a couple of them in for those first classes and say, look, I was I, I, at last year. I probably could. Um, my, our, our, we have, a, I have a curriculum person that I work with. She's my admin. She's really great. And she's really letting me kind of run with this, um, 
I share all my data with her. I share everything. And she's just like, yeah, let's do it. So uh, she suggested maybe videoing some of the kids, this, you mm-hmm. know, and have them say something. And then I can use that. I'm like, that's a great idea. Definitely. So I think I'm going to do that. And they are allowing me next year. The experiment will be, and I mean, experiment as not, not, not loosely, but very closely. Like, I'm like, let me have these kids. I need more time. I keep saying that I need more time. So they're going to take, I'm going to have three or four reading classes and all those kids will be in one English one class with me. Oh, awesome. So that will allow for what the skills yeah. that they're learning in English. I'll know what they are and I already know where they are. So I'll be able to, you know, bring that over into English. Hey, we learned, remember when we learned about like, what do we, you know, how can we do stuff? And I use a lot of audio visual stuff. Of course. And um, so that's going to be good. And I will also have a class of sophomores who are repeating freshman English that are failing, that are, that already failed semester one or failed or, or, or are failing this current semester. So I'll have one group of an English one class with the sophomores who needed, they need more help. They need the support and they need to be reminded that it, they don't always make that crossover of what I'm learning and how do I apply that in a content area when I'm reading something that kind of just flew right over my head. So, well, these are definitely so lucky to have you. You're an amazing teacher. No, I can't wait. Trying. I can't wait to our conversations tomorrow when we're speaking about your journey. So where you were when you had that balanced literacy and Fontas and Pinnell training and how you've made this gradual progression to you know, high school and making the changes amongst these students. And then on Wednesday, you're going to give us a peek inside your classroom and your favorite tools and strategies. And I think it's going to be really important, especially for the teachers who are in similar positions, Mm -hmm. because every child has a right to read. Yes. And we're doing a disservice to them. And you know what? Every teacher deserves to have the skills to teach them and not be in a position where they have to learn them on their own. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed our conversation and I look forward to speaking to you tomorrow and Wednesday. Mm -hmm. For those of you who are listening to this as a podcast or as a replay, if you go down to the show notes, you will find references to the Uh, recommendations we spoke about and the document that I uh, got that quote from. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Bye.